His job, trying to understand how your brain works. So your brain exists encased in silence and darkness inside your skull. How does the brain, with its hundreds of billions of neurons, put together reality for us? David sees science as a creative act. From crashing a wedding to collect DNA, to studying people who see the world in strange colors. The number nine is hot pink. Just the way that we see the world is different. To dropping people from really high places. It all started by accident. When I was eight years old, I went climbing on the roof of a house, and I fell off of the roof. On the way down, I was thinking about Alice in Wonderland. When you are the person doing the falling, it seems like it takes a long time. All of us have some moments in our lives that seem to last forever, and other moments that go by in an instant. So that got me interested in the issue of time perception. That's when David found the tower. You're dropped from a 150-foot tall tower in free fall backwards, and you're caught in a net below. It took me eight months to get permission from the university to do this experiment. You're going up this very long elevator ride up to the top. They clip you in and they hang you backwards through this hole in the cage. And it's a long way down to the net, and at that point you're feeling pretty scared. And you're going 70 miles an hour when you hit the net. I'm an adrenaline junkie, but it's absolutely terrifying. It's not like fun going on a roller coaster. It's just, you know, scary. So was this free fall scary enough to create a time distortion? When they're remembering their own fall, people think it took a much longer time. Once they release you, like, your mind just goes blank. So we had the duration distortion. Now the question is, are they actually seeing in slow motion during the fall? So I realized what we needed to do was invent a device that didn't exist. So he built a special wrist-mounted monitor where he could speed up the pixels until they moved too fast for a brain to perceive the number. Researchers strapped the monitor to each person's wrist and told them to try and read the high-speed numbers as they fell. So if they're slowing down like a movie camera in slow motion, they'll be able to see very different information on the watch. When we analyze the results from the eagle eye, they can't read the numbers any better during the fall than they can on the ground. It turns out that people are not actually seeing in slow motion. And so this was very unexpected because I had hoped originally that we would be able to show that people have this extra special mode that they can kick into where they're seeing in slow motion. David continues to study time perception, but understands you don't always get the answers you want when you try to break new scientific ground. Nine out of ten great ideas turn out to be really wrong, uh, but the tenth one, you can hit the ball out of the park. And it's questions like this that David tackles in his lab. The vibe in my lab isn't so much the white coats and clipboards. It's more of a creative think tank. All of our walls are covered in dry erase paint. I have a special coffee mug. I can write on it. I asked David, actually, because I was you know, a little worried, is it OK if I get a mohawk? And he's just like, yeah, I think it's great. Be creative and just really embrace that kind of difference. From the beginning, David has never taken the ordinary approach to science. Growing up in New Mexico, he was fascinated to hear his father, a forensic psychiatrist, talk about the criminal minds he studied, including mass murderer William Wayne Gilbert. Somebody said to my father, I'm sure that Gilbert feels remorse for what he's done. And my father realized this was a very incorrect view because Gilbert felt the kind of excitement when he was going to murder someone that he had felt as a child on the night before Christmas. So that taught me that it's actually quite impossible to project yourself into someone else's brain. Listening to the stories about the strange minds of murderers, he became obsessed with how someone's brain could create a reality so different from his own. But the problem was, science class left him cold. Unfortunately, I didn't like high school science that much. There's always the answer in the back of the book, and what you're trying to do is get yourself through something that other people have already invented. At Rice University, David majored in literature, but while he was supposed to be reading the classics, he found himself wandering into a different part of the stacks, 
the neuroscience section. And it never struck me that I might actually go into a career in neuroscience until a friend of mine suggested that. He said, well, why don't you become a neuroscientist? Why don't you study the brain as your career? And it just felt like, oh yeah, of course. After receiving his PhD from the Baylor College of Medicine, he opened his own guerrilla-style lab where he looked for unique ways to show how the brain creates reality. That's when he started reading about a peculiar condition that had never been systematically studied, synesthesia. I just view synesthesia as a different way of perceiving the world. Where people blend unrelated senses. A's are always red and M's are green. So their letters and numbers have colors. Zero is white, um, one is black, two is kind of a light pink color, two is fuchsia. Or they feel music as if it's floating around them. I would feel things, I guess, starting from below me and behind me, spiraling up, going through this piano range, and then ending somewhere in the corner. When I used to do spelling bees, it was really easy for me to reproduce the spelling of the word based on the colors I would see. And when I was in eighth grade, um, I got second in the Texas spelling bee. F was A-P-P-L-A-U-S-E. Most of the papers in the literature just had a single subject in it. They would say, we have found a synesthete and here are her characteristics. So I thought, is there a way that we could actually get thousands of synesthetes? And so I turned to the internet. David designed an online test to verify that someone has synesthesia and it spread virally. So at this point, I've interviewed and rigorously verified and have all the data on over 6,000 synesthetes. And that has really changed the field. He now had a huge pool of subjects he could study with the latest scientific tools. So it turned out that one of our synesthetes was getting married. David saw a guerrilla science opportunity. The family would all be at the wedding, but what he really wanted was their DNA. We crashed a wedding where a whole bunch of people were coming together from the family. And we showed up and we had everybody spit in the spit kit. Then we left. And that was a great way to get a lot of data at once. Next, he wanted to look inside the heads of synesthetes to see just how their brains worked. We take someone with synesthesia, they go inside the fMRI machine, then we show them a video from Sesame Street. And we've turned it into grayscale, so there's no color involved. But there are lots of letters and numbers flying at them. The fMRI gives David a map of what parts of their brain are active. When the synesthetes watched the video, they saw something very different from the rest of us. Even though the cartoon was in black and white, I perceived the number as being in color. So what clues did he find in the fMRI images? What we seem to be finding is that the areas involved in letters and numbers are right next to the areas involved in colors and textures and spatial forms. What David saw supports the idea of a kind of crosstalk between two adjacent but unrelated parts of the brain. It appears that in synesthesia, there's just a slight tweak on that. Activity in some area will actually excite activity in a neighboring area. So this has led us to a new anatomical understanding of what's happening in synesthesia. With each new experiment, David understands more about how the tiniest changes in our brain profoundly shape our realities. It turns out that people's realities can be quite different. David's own brain has helped him forge a unique path full of triumphs and failures that is changing how we view our most vital of organs. Brains are like fingerprints and they're slightly different than everybody. So being inside my head and being inside someone else's head can be very different. And studying such unusual brains has helped him understand just how different our realities can be. We're different on so many levels. Even just the way that we see the world is different from one person to the next. I don't know what it would be like to have letters and numbers that didn't have colors. Like that seems like it would be such a dull and drab way to experience them.